Hi guys, <clears throat> I appreciate you few people on the planet still hanging in there as we head into chapter 20 of Peruvian Plunge where we're taking a reverse plunge back to Cusco. So we will uh, label this chapter Final Ascent into Hell. But we're going to start out with some long overdue words from Cormac McCarthy's The Road, copyright 2006. <clears throat> the world was soon to be populated by men who would eat your children in front of your eyes, and the cities themselves held by cores of blackened looters who tunneled among the ruins and crawled from the rubble white of tooth and eye carrying charred and anonymous tins of food and nylon nets like shoppers in the commissaries of hell. Out on the road, the pilgrims sank down and fell over and died, and the bleak and shrouded earth went trundling past the sun and returned again as trackless and unremarked as the path of any nameless sister world in the ancient dark beyond. You tell them. <clears throat> this brings us to Thursday morning, June 18th, 2009, in the hellhole of Mazuco, Peru, halfway between Puerto Maldonado and Cusco. <clears throat> Four days shy of one month from my maiden plunge into the Peruvian Amazon marked the day I would climb back out. After aborting my 60-day planned adventure teaching English to the non-existent Indians at the Ritzy Manu Wildlife Center 43 days early, I was heading back to Cusco to regroup and reshuffle my deck. The first item on my to-do list before climbing into a mini-bus that would be my chariot back across the Andes along the real road to hell the second leg of the trans-oceanic highway that I was traveling from Puerto Maldonado to Cusco was, as it was every day, to find a cup of coffee. At least this was one Peruvian challenge I should have no trouble conquering, I confidently assumed as I soaked up in the hot shower of my comfortable but overpriced hotel room. The hotel had its own restaurant, and the big chalkboard menu that filled half the wall of the restaurant stated clearly that the restaurant served coffee. There was only one catch I discovered upon strolling into the lobby before 8 a.m. They served coffee for lunch and dinner for the perfectly sensible reason that they were closed for breakfast on Thursday mornings. I whined and begged with my most pitiful gringo starving puppy act, but the nice woman who was in the kitchen cooking breakfast for herself and her family that ran the hotel refused, suggesting I go to the restaurant a block down the street. She knew they served breakfast on Thursday, and she was right. The restaurant did, in fact, serve breakfast on Thursday. There was just one little catch. They did not serve coffee for breakfast. The nice man who ran that restaurant pointed to yet another restaurant across the street. I could find coffee there, he assured me. Well, he was wrong too. The nice woman who ran the third restaurant sent me down the street to a fourth restaurant. Same story open for breakfast, but no coffee for breakfast. I offered to go to the fucking store and buy some fucking coffee if she would just give me some fucking hot water. I knew she had hot water because her restaurant was full of folks drinking hot tea, obviously the breakfast beverage of choice in Manuco, Peru, on Thursday morning at least. <clears throat> she said, that plan would never work. However, she promised that if I walked just one more block, I would find an open restaurant 
that served coffee for breakfast on Thursday morning. She was sure of it. Arriving at the fifth restaurant, I was overjoyed to find a menu in the window stating they were open and they served coffee. Yes! There was just one little catch. This restaurant, like the one in my hotel, was in fact closed for breakfast on Thursday mornings. The strange thing about this closed restaurant was the fact that people were walking in and out of the door. I followed a group of local mazookans through the door. We walked through one restaurant, which was dark and obviously not open for business, to yet another restaurant, my sixth of the morning, located behind it. The place was jammed with early morning diners. Eureka! Coffee! At last! Well, not so fast. The nice woman at the packed restaurant told me, sorry, but they did not serve coffee. I know you think I'm making this shit up, guys, but I'll bet you a cup of coffee in Mazuko, Peru, that every word of what I am saying is the honest to Gaia truth. At that point, I was ready to let loose with a gringo rant in two different languages about the brains and business acumen of Peruvian restaurateurs who did not offer coffee, one of the major cash crops of Peru for breakfast. The nice woman cut me off just as I was gearing up and led me by the hand back into the closed restaurant that I had walked through on my way to her busy open restaurant. And there, sitting on the counter of the dark and gloomy restaurant, was a two-liter thermos of boiling hot water, a bowl of sugar, and a jar of the dreaded Nescafe. All I can assume is that Rumpelstiltskinito is the one who set the water, sugar, and Nescafe on the counter of the closed restaurant because nobody, not even an Amazonian Indian who knew the secret code for when buses were leaving, <clears throat> would have had any way of knowing it was there. The nice woman from the open restaurant yelled through the kitchen door of the closed restaurant, Another nice woman appeared from the kitchen and took my 33 cents. She even managed to find a can of evaporated milk, no doubt delivered by bus from Salvacion. Depending on your math, it had taken me somewhere between five and seven restaurants and close to 45 minutes to get a fucking cup of Nescafe. By this time, I was almost six blocks from the bus stop, freaking out that I would miss the one eight-passenger minibus I hurried up the crowded sidewalk to find. I was, in fact, the first person of the day to arrive. I asked the kindly bus driver how long it would be before we left. Dependiente. That depends, he said, shrugging. Apparently, our departure time depended on how long it took for seven more passengers to arrive. What was his best estimate? Trenta minutos? Thirty minutes, he said, nodding sagely. Hmm, where had I heard that confident treinta minutos before? Oh yeah, and Pilcapata from the mouth of the very first Peruvian Amazon bus driver I had ever met. On the remote chance that the guy knew what the hell he was talking about, I figured it was in my best interest to head back to my hotel where I had started out on my long search for coffee close to an hour before to retrieve my bag of cannonballs. I don't need to tell you what I found upon arriving at the hotel. An open restaurant with real coffee on the menu. I lugged my bag of cannonballs back to the bus and claimed the right corner of the rear seat. I sat down and began to read Becoming, the third book in the handbook for the New Paradigm series, to get some pointers 
on how to foment my planet-wide revolution in consciousness from the back seat of an empty minibus in the Peruvian Amazon, sidelined on the shoulder of the road to hell and China in a town where you had to visit seven restaurants to get a fucking cup of Nescafe brewed by Rumpelstiltskinito. The space aliens who wrote the book implored me to keep the faith that if I manifested really, really hard this magical, critical mass of awakening souls would join me in my revolution just as soon as seven more passengers were able to find a cup of coffee in Mazuko, Peru, and therefore awaken themselves enough to join me on the minibus on the road to hell, if not in the revolution. Thirty minutes later, it goes without saying, I was still sitting there, alone, on the bus, waiting for passengers number two to eight to join me to get this revolution and consciousness on the road. By this time, I needed to pee, and I was getting hungry. Just for grins, I asked the driver how long, in his honest opinion, it would be before the bus departed. Treinta minutos, he said, nodding sagely. On the hair-thin chance that seven passengers might actually swarm the empty bus in the next 30 minutes, and considering what I had learned about the vagaries of restaurant service in Mazuko, Peru, I figured it would probably serve my best interest if I just grabbed a quick fried egg sandwich, <clears throat> energized by a brain and bladder full of Nescafe, I set off, set off on my second culinary challenge of the morning. <clears throat> As the driver had seen fit to set my bag of cannonballs in plain view and easy reach of every thief in the poverty-stricken town, I figured I should keep it in view by getting a fried egg sandwich from the closest restaurant. This turned out to be restaurant number three from my morning Nescafe Odyssey. I ordered two fried egg sandwiches to go, but was given the bad news. The restaurant had eggs, but there was one little catch. They had no bread. For the second time in an hour, the nice woman referred me to her competition down the street, who she was sure could whip me up a delicious fried egg sandwich. For the second time, she was wrong. Restaurant number two, formerly restaurant number four, could whip me up a disgusting Peruvian cheese sandwich or a chicken sandwich, would have, which could have taken 30 minutes to prepare, but there was one more problem with a fried egg sandwich. They had bread to put the eggs between, but they did not serve eggs for breakfast. <clears throat> for the second time in an hour, the nice woman set me down the street to the open restaurant behind the closed restaurant, where she assured me, and I knew this was true, as I had just seen the place packed with diners, I could get a fried egg sandwich. <clears throat> well, she and I were both wrong. The single biggest, busiest breakfast joint in all of Mazuko, Peru, which did not serve coffee, had neither eggs nor bread. Apparently, their one menu item that packed the place to the rafters every morning was chicken soup. Fine, I'll get a fucking bowl of chicken soup for my awakening soul. There was just one little catch. There was no way they could serve me chicken soup to go. The nice woman who had saved my ass before said, no problema, she knew where to find two fried egg sandwiches to go. Who wants to guess where that would be? You got it, the darkened, closed restaurant where I got the cup of Nescafe an hour earlier. The nice woman led me back into the dark tomb, shouted something in Spanish through the closed door of the closed kitchen of the closed restaurant, and five minutes later, I was the proud owner of two 
absolutely delicious fried egg sandwiches served on bread that tasted like it just came out of the oven. I paid my 66 cent tab for my hard won prize and beat it back to the bus where I got to sit for more than an hour waiting for seven more passengers. It was now past 10.30, some two hours since the driver had predicted 30 minutes. Guys, you tell me, is it any wonder that it has taken over five centuries to push a lousy two-lane paved road over the Andes and across the Peruvian Amazon to Brazil? And it would probably have taken another half a millennium if it had been left up to the Peruvians to do it. As much as I despise, from the bottom of my little hambone heart, the fucking Chinese planet eaters building that road from hell that very well could be the tipping point that takes this planet over the edge and into oblivion, I have to sheepishly admit that I can sympathize with them. Even a planet eater can take on a so much bullshit like I went through trying to get a lousy cup of coffee and a fucking fried egg sandwich before moving to what Don Juan Matus would call the point beyond all pity to say, fuck it, out of the way Peru, we'll build the damn road ourselves. I would have done the same thing if I was a Chinese planet eater. And let's be honest here, do you think those Texas millionaire buddies of George Bush and Dick Cheney that run the show at Hunt Oil Company, the ones who have President Peruvian, Peruvian President Alan Garcia on a puppet string, really give a flying fuck about the folks down there in Peru whose lives are getting ready to be destroyed by their dirty little pipeline across the rainforest? Anyone who can't figure out how to fry a fucking egg and boil a cup of water to make a lousy cup of coffee simply does not have what it takes to kick big oil out of the jungle, even if they wanted to, which I'm not at all convinced they do. I know it, you know it, and the big wigs that Hunt Oil Company know it. The reason the planet eaters have, to have such carte blanche to wreak such havoc in the Amazon is because nobody down there has the brains to stop them, even if they had the will. Where are you, oh great space aliens that are supposed to come fix this mess? Uh. The last two passengers to board the minibus were two friendly, chatty young men who were on their way to the huge party. Huge party? What huge party? Scheduled to begin the very next day in Cusco, they were astounded to find a gringo on the bus. Apparently, it was rare enough to see a white face on the real bus from Puerto Maldonado to Cusco, but it was a regular blue moon occasion to find one overnighting in Mazuco. They asked me where I was from. When I said Texas, one of them said without missing a beat, Claro, usted es petrolero, no? Of course, you're an oil company worker, no? I assured them and everyone else on the bus that I was not a petrolero and I gave a 30 second summation of my opinion of my fellow Texans which only seemed to confuse everybody. I returned the question and asked them what they did for a living. <clears throat> With great pride and cockiness, one of them announced that they were hydroelectric engineers taking a short break from their jobs at the nightmarish planet-eating brainchild of Brazilian President Lula da Silva, hmm, known as the Madeira River Dam, which is not Belo Monte, guys. You know, Lula is a big supporter of hydroelectric dams in the Amazon rainforest. 
Don't even get me started on that Planet Eater's wet dream of death and destruction, which is almost, but not quite, rivaling in evil scope its big brother, the road to hell we were traveling together. I'm not sure I would be able to survive the spiritual descent into hell that a visit to that scene of destruction would entail to bring you a first-hand report, so I guess you'll have to Google it if there's still any lingering doubt in your mind that the Amazon jungle is doomed, you know, with Lula at the helm. <clears throat> As I got to know these two fellows over the next 10 hours as we traveled deeper and deeper into one of the most hellish scenes of Gaian destruction and despair that I have ever encountered, I sunk deeper and deeper into my own despair. These two fellows were genuinely nice guys. <clears throat> they were bright, intelligent, engaging, educated, funny, life-loving young men, and they made their living, and probably a damn good one by Peruvian standards, ripping the heart and lungs out of Mother Earth, literally drowning her in a giant pool of her own blood. How many trees like the one I had sat in, how many monkeys, how many birds, how much life would be slaughtered, how many of Gaia's children's voices would be forever silenced so the skyrocketing population of Brazil could have a few thousand more blaring TV sets and microwave ovens and blow dryers and clothes dryers to poison the brains and the minds of those awakening souls who think their lives will be enriched by such crap. In other words, those folks who want to be just like us and get their fair share of the pie that gringos have been hogging for way too long. The guys obviously believed and believed strongly in their convictions that what they were doing for humanity, for this planet, was a good thing. <clears throat> they were damn proud of their jobs and no doubt the money it made for them and their families. They were bringing that wasteland out of the Stone Age and into the Space Age where it should have been 50 years ago. I bet they could whip up a fried egg sandwich and a real cup of coffee in 10 minutes. Critical mass my ass. I was looking at the only critical mass building in the Amazon jungle, and they were sitting right beside me on the bus, rolling down the road from hell to China, laughing and partying all the way to Cusco in oblivion with smiles on their handsome, tragically misled faces. Virgil's chariot crossed the long bridge over the Peruvian version of the River Styx, and I was officially cast out of the arms of the Mother of God to re-enter the Peruvian state of Cusco. Don't let the name fool you. Though the modern cosmopolitan city <clears throat> was, as the Macaw or tourist plane flies, Perhaps 100 straight line miles away, we were still very much in the jungle, and we still had 10 grueling hours of travel ahead of us, a journey that would plunge me into a state of existential despair whose surface we had only begun to scratch the previous afternoon. The odyssey began pleasantly and deceptively enough. As the sun burned off the last of the morning's heavy gray blanket of clouds, we began a slow but steady climb up a gently sloping verdant river valley. The wide modern highway had just been paved, and more importantly, the planet eaters had not yet penetrated this part of the cool mountain forest. Ironically, the road construction crews had inadvertently been protecting this forest from the logging crews. So, when passing through the area, you can be lulled into believing that all is quiet on the western front of the highway to hell. 
When I passed through this stretch of roadway in the summer of 2009, the only completely unimproved place left to fix was that high plains section in the Alpine Pass between the towns of Okongate to the east and Urkos to the west. There were only three spots two landslide prone portions and one tricky creek bridge left to finish between Mazuko and Okangate. Between these three trouble spots the road was brand new and the forest still lush and fresh. In some almost subliminal melancholy way, this lovely snapshot of what we're getting ready to lose when the floodgates open is even worse than the glaring overexposed photo of the sun-blasted wasteland of the former lowland rainforest we have already lost at the bottom of the hill in Madre de Dios. Mark my words, in the in that brief blink of an eye, figure 2010 to 2012, between the time the planet-eating road construction machinery rolls out and the logging trucks roll in, Peru will still have, as it does today, a golden opportunity to save this forest forever. And they're going to take that golden opportunity and flush it right down the toilet. China, Brazil, and the Andean Development Corporation are not in the postcard photo business. They're in the planet-eating business, and you can already hear the planet-eaters in Beijing licking their chops over that gorgeous swath of southeastern Peru right now. We hit our first hour-long roadblock just a few miles outside of Mazuko. When we were finally waved through and saw the reason for the holdup, I was almost disappointed in a darkly ironic sort of way. That pesky little mountain in the way of progress should be out of the way within a week. Nothing a few sticks of dynamite, bulldozers, and dump trucks couldn't handle in the effort to turn a mountain into a molehill. Our brave little bus picked its way slowly through the quarter mile of ruts and boulders, and it was back on pavement again. Next on the obstacle course was the final bridge left to wrap up between Mazuko and Okagate. We ground to our second dead halt of the day, and I hopped out of the bus to get up close and personal with the Planet Eaters whose challenge was to build a concrete bridge over a rushing mountain stream erupting from the side of a steep hillside. To meet this challenge, a bright orange, of course, cement mixer the size of a water tank was backed up against the chasm of the creek, spinning like a top to keep the soupy mix from settling. The gooey gray sludge oozed like diarrhea from the backside of the big truck down a long metal sluice and into the ant-like line of workers. Each man would fill his wheelbarrow with wet cement and race to pour it between prefabricated wooden forms. Inch by inch, the concrete engineering marvel was advancing over the oncoming creek, which if you looked up or downstream from the bridge, was every bit as gorgeous as any photo from Manu National Park. Gringo still suffering from emerald forest noble savage fantasies would half expect to see a real Stone Age Indian peering out in distress from behind the thick foliage. We truly began to enter the seventh or eighth ring of Dante's Inferno after our third hour-long roadblock of the day. <clears throat> Following a police escort, we rolled slightly downhill for a mile or so into a narrow river valley. Actually, canyon would be a more accurate description of this two-mile stretch of roadway as the word valley implies, there is enough flat space along the side of a stream to build a road. In this case, no such 
level space existed beyond the narrow landslide plagued jeep trail that had been serving as the Cusco to Puerto Maldonado highway for years. To one side of this burrow trail flowed a rushing mountain stream. On the other side, near vertical mountain sides lined the gorge to force a 60-foot wide roadbed through this pass, you either had to push the road into the river, shave a 30-foot strip off the side of the mountain, or a little bit of both. The ambitious and optimistic highway engineers had obviously chosen option number three, the little bit of both, also known as the two wrongs make a right option. It appeared that in previous weeks the planet-eating earth-moving equipment operators had lived up to their names by simply moving as much earth as they could over the side of the riverbank. Dirt, rocks, trees, small villages, slow-moving old ladies, whatever else got in the way of their blade to scrape perhaps 10 feet of new road service directly alongside the stream bank. The fact that this option totally destroyed every stick of erosion controlling vegetation along the unstable stream bank while dumping thousands of tons of silt and mud into the trout stream in the process apparently never occurred to the engineers like mercury from a mother of god gold mine it would be someone else's problem to deal with <clears throat> the day the billion dollar roadway falls into the river with the first hard rain which it will sooner or later have no fear even after the hard pressed road builders had pressed every inch they could out of the limited space between the river bank and the mountainside they were still perhaps 20 feet shy of their target, space enough to let a full logging truck pass an empty logging truck. With no other option available, they did what any self-respecting planet eater deserving of the name would have done under the circumstances. They literally started gnawing away the side of the mountain, one stick of dynamite and one dump truck full of rock at a time, our merry little band of travelers rolled onto the scene of destruction in mid-mountain eating, genuinely impressed at the sheer David versus Goliath tenacity with which mere mortals were rising to the challenge, my fellow passengers uh, and I begged the driver to pull over so we could watch their performance from a discreetly safe distance. As horrific and depressing as it was to witness on one hand, this display of Gaian matricide was almost beautiful in a poetically macabre sort of way. For 15 minutes, the nine of us sat transfixed as we watched in awe as some sort of two-story tall, hornet yellow creature from a tree hugger's worst nightmare, some kind of cross between a bulldozer and a steam shovel with an eight-foot pick sticking out its front, would roll up on metal tank treads to a bus-sized boulder, which had previously been birthed from its maternal mountainside by dynamite, and begin to batter it. After perhaps a dozen jabs by the giant pick, a piece of solid rock, perhaps the size of a VW bug, would break off. At this point, the patient and skilled tractor operator would somehow, and nobody on the bus knew how, manage to work the multi-ton chunk of rock into the shovel and from there into the back of a humongous blue dump truck. How the axles did not snap or the tires didn't blow out under all that enormous weight remains a mystery to this day. As I watched this gruesome but awe-inspiring display of mountain eating, seeing with my own eyes 
how two men with my own two eyes, how two men with a big enough shovel and a big enough truck could literally eat the face off a solid rock mountain. Any naive pretense I had remaining, which wasn't much, that the Amazon rainforest is too big to ever be flattened by the planet eaters, hopped off the bus and committed suicide by jumping into the silt-laden ruined trout stream beside us. Short of building a bridge across the Pacific Ocean to China, and that's not a challenge, universe, the planet eaters will find a way to get the job done. If the truck or the tractor isn't big enough for the job, well, build a bigger truck and tractor. Where there's a planet to be eaten and a planet eater to eat it, there is a way. We sat there and watched three of the boulders disappear into the cavernous dumpster on the back of the truck and continued on our merry way. Rounding the very next bend, we came to a sign, to a sign announcing Zona Urbana, which you know, the urban zone, which amounted to six shacks clinging desperately to the riverbank amid the construction madness. A line of wet clothes hung on a line in the swirling red dust, already filthy beyond wearing before they were even dry. The riverbank scraper had kindly steered around their hovels, for now anyway, but it was clear the village's days were numbered. The dark humor of the Zona Urbana became a wee bit more unsettling when we rounded the next bend and encountered a, a village of perhaps 200 or 300 people. These folks, clearly native, most likely leaning more toward the Inca end of the spectrum than the Amazonian end at this altitude, had made the unfortunate decision to make their homes on that tiny shelf of land between the Cusco to Puerto Maldonado Highway and the mountainside behind them. The advancing column of planet-eating machinery had resumed again on the western edge in its relentless march to the Pacific Ocean. It was obvious that there was nowhere else for the road to go except directly through, make that over the village. By the time you read this, the town will have been wiped off the face of the planet like everything else in the Planet Eater's path. Emerging from the narrow gorge, we hit pavement again and had a relatively uneventful ride through the last vestiges of cloud forest. Sitting squarely along that knife edge line between cloud forest and high plains was the depressing hellhole of Okongate, Peru. To celebrate our emergence from the Peruvian Amazon, the driver pulled to a stop at the auspicious hour of 4.20 p.m. for a late lunch of sheep soup, or so I was told, though I could not be sure what the mystery meat was floating around in the brown slop. It was the kind of meal that every guidebook on every third world country ever printed warns you about particularly if you are getting ready to climb on a bus with no bathroom for a four-hour trip across the middle of nowhere. Screw it, I was hungry, and it was literally what the universe had put on my plate. So, I ate it. Pulling out of Okungate, the road opened up into a broad, modern highway that would have fit right in with any in the U.S., I asked the young planet eater beside me if we had gotten through the worst of the construction. He considered my question and remarked in Spanglish, parts of the road are paved and parts are still under construction. 
As I knew that the machinery was shut down at 5 p.m., I figured in my usual naive way that the worst was behind us, and I settled back in my seat to enjoy a gorgeous Andean sunset over the broad, flat valley we were cruising along beside. And then the paved part of the modern highway screeched to a sudden halt at the end of the valley. Just as I had begun to settle in to the smooth ride in the soft light of early evening, we plunged into a scene of such utter planet-eating chaos, such over-the-top total destruction of a natural landscape that for a moment I figured I must have fallen asleep and landed in a dirt-worshipping tree-hugger's worst nightmare. It was truly a nightmare, but I was very much awake. The only bright side of this from my tree hugger's perspective is that we were no longer in the biodiversity rich forest, so praise Gaia, the scene of devastation wrought by the planet eaters was at least limited to bare rock and the few species that lived there. When the Okangate Valley ended, there was literally nowhere left around a 60-foot road. I don't care how big your truck or tractor is. Even a planet eater has to hit a wall at some point. Since there was no way to put a highway on one side of the river, now a tumbling series of waterfalls pouring out of the east flank of the Andes, or the other, the enterprising highway engineers had come up with the brilliantly simple idea of routing the river right down the middle of the road. In other words, they split the highway in half with the west running lanes clinging desperately to one riverbank and the east running lanes clinging to the other. Any pretense of environmental oversight, not that there ever was such a pretense, over this part of the project had flown out the window as the planet eaters had abandoned all restraint in their desperate zeal to ship the Amazon jungle to China. It was a regular Bosch's garden of earthly delights of planet-eating frenzy, an orgy of dynamite and dump trucks that climbed higher and higher up the eastern flank of the Andes until, mercifully, the construction project and the daylight that illuminated it ceased altogether. All that is left now for the planet eaters to figure out is how to get that last little link in the chain finished and paved, and the Brazil to China highway from hell will be a reality, and the real planet eating can begin in earnest. As darkness descended over our little chariot and my stomach began to churn, the following rant bubbled into my mind like gas from my guts. Here comes three dozen years of bilious hambone vitriol born in the basement of a comfortable middle-class home in suburban Atlanta. If you don't want to get hit, by this blast of psychic puke that has been bubbling inside me since I first laid eyes on that famous Taming the Green Hell photo from Life magazine that has dogged me for most of my life, you'd better get out of the way because here it comes. And I am going to break right here before erupting into this rant. So you will have to come back to part two in just a minute. Bye, guys.